the address. I thank the House. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Moments ago, it was revealed that the New South Wales Police have formed Strike Force Garrard to investigate possible criminal behaviour connected to the Minister for Emissions Reduction. What action will the Prime Minister take? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, um, I would simply note that any investigations that are undertaken are matter for authorities in other places other than here. And uh, I would refer the, the, uh, the member uh, to those authorities in terms of what they are doing. But, Mr on Speaker, left. there seems to be a presumption made by those on the other side, which they have a habit of making, Mr Speaker. And they, if they wish to make smears against members, Mr Speaker, there are standing orders that prevent them from doing that, and I assume that's what they're seeking to do on this occasion. The member for Isaacs, members on my left. The member for Goldstone. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain economic management is enabling Australians to plan their economic future with certainty. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, um, members of this place will know that this is not the first time Australians have faced economic challenges in our history. But I tell you what, our government has great confidence in the Australian people. We know that Australians uh, have it fully within their capacity to confront whatever challenges they face. And we have seen that most recently in their strength and resilience in relation to drought, in relation to bushfires and in relation to the many challenges that we face globally as there are pressures that are in the global economy that impact on our own. Yet despite that, our economy continues to grow. Despite that, jobs continue to be added, Mr Speaker, over the course of the past year and over the course of our government. And Australians continue to go out there and back themselves and make decisions for themselves and for their future. Now, our plan, our plan gives Australians the confidence that they need. It gives them the ability to plan for their future with confidence by putting the settings in place that enables Australians to back themselves, Mr Speaker. That plan, that plan involves ensuring lower taxes both now and into the future. Lower taxes that we have already Member for Rankin will opposed cease opposed tooth and nail by the Labor Party at the last election, drag kicking and screaming, and those tax reductions legislated for the future. So they know that the better they do in the years ahead, the better they, they invest, the more chances they take, the more they put themselves out there, Mr Speaker, they know they're being backed by a government which enables them to keep more of what they earn so they can plan to earn more, Mr Speaker, because they're backed by a tax system under this government, which means they can keep more of what they earn. By building the infrastructure that our economy needs to grow, by ensuring that we have stable and certain financial management which keeps expenditure under control, which keeps taxes down, which ensures that we can pay down debt. And and we don't increase taxes and increase the burden on Australians so they can plan confidently for their future. So we can guarantee the essentials that Australians rely on at the same time as managing our budget, which means six billion extra this year and next financial year for health and education, two billion extra and more for aged care and a staggering $9 billion more this year and next year to support the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which will see another 170,000 people come into that scheme over this year and next year and with a budget to support it. Mr Speaker, taking action now on climate change without taking people's jobs with the reckless targets that those opposite would prescribe and that will not put up with pressure on power prices and ensuring that we keep Australians safe. That's the agenda, which means Australians can plan for their future with confidence, not the chaos panic merchants of those on the other side who would blow it all away. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again addressed to the Prime Minister. The Ministerial Code makes it the personal responsibility of the Prime Minister to decide whether to stand aside a minister in the exact circumstances that the Minister for Emissions Reduction now finds himself in. 
Prime Minister, the New South Wales Police have established strike force Garrard into the potential criminal behaviour of a minister sitting on your front bench right now. Prime Minister, why is he still sitting there? When will you stand the him aside? The Leader of the Opposition aside? time has concluded. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the information that you're referring Prime to Minister, has not been Prime presented Minister, to just me pause by the for a second. Members on my left will cease interjecting. I will deal very harshly with those interjecting. I thank the member for Sydney for acknowledging that. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the matters that the opposition leader refers to have not been provided to me or be presented to me by the New South Wales Police. I have not been advised of those developments, Mr Speaker, and so I think that deals with the issues that he has raised in relation to the code. But, Mr Speaker, can I say about the Minister for Energy and the Minister for Emissions Reduction? I think I can understand why those opposite have taken such a keen interest in him, Mr Speaker, because he's responsible for policies that we are finally starting to see stabilise electricity prices in this country and take the pressure off the member for Barton families. is warned. And he's overseeing an emissions reduction program, Mr. Speaker, which is taking action on climate change without taking the jobs of Australians, Mr. Speaker, which is the policies of those opposite. The member so, Mr. for Barton Speaker, has been I, warned. I am enabling the minister to continue to get around his job. His job, Mr Speaker, which is about getting power prices down and which is about meeting our important commitments to take action on climate change. Now, Mr Speaker, they might not like the progress that he is making as a minister. They may feel uncomfortable, Mr Speaker, about the progress that this minister is making. But, Mr Speaker, at the end of the day, the Australian people know when they see their power bills start to stabilise and when they see the fact that we are taking the action that we need to on climate change without taking their jobs, they will know that the Labor Party once again is on, on another frolic, Mr Speaker, and we know where these frolics always end. Just before I call the Leader of the Opposition, the member for Cooper's warned, the member for Barton was warned twice and continued to interject she will leave under 94A. And I, the Leader of the Opposition, seeking to table a document. I, I am, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to table the Daily Telegraph, New South Wales Police to investigate fraudulent document claim against Angus Taylor and The Guardian, New South Wales Police. You just attach yourself, that's fine. New South Wales Police investigating doctor document Angus Taylor used in Clovermore attack. I seek I just say I, I've made it clear previously documents that are readily available and they're readily the, the, the member for Chifley, his voice I recognise, I can't see him behind the manager of opposition business, will cease interjecting. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Yeah. Um, point of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister specifically in his answer said that he did not have this information. And therefore, and therefore it is appropriate that we be able to seek leave to table. Okay, you can seek leave. Uh, the Leader of the House. Answer. Leave is not granted. The member for Nichols. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister inform the House how the Morrison-McCormack government is providing stability and certainty through the delivery of infrastructure projects, particularly in my electorate of Nichols? The Deputy Prime Minister has the Thank call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, good news for Australia. The trade bills have just passed in the Senate, yeah, yeah, yeah. and much of our infrastructure, indeed all of our infrastructure, is predicated on the fact that we're getting these trade arrangements organised with uh, trading partners. We need to get product to port and then port to overseas countries uh, quicker. That's what we're doing, such as the uh, Chukamoama Bridge, Mr Speaker. That particular, that particular piece of infrastructure, where we've now provided an additional $28.7 million in the member for Nichols electorate, is going to ensure the safer passage of product to port and then on to some of those countries which we've just arranged more trading bilateral relationships with in the Senate. So well done to the Senate. 
Well done to the parliament. This is delivery in action. This is what the Liberals and Nationals do. This is what we promised on May 18, and this is what we are delivering to the people, particularly in regional communities. They're doing it tough at the moment with the drought. They need better infrastructure. That's why last week we brought forward a considerable amount of infrastructure, billions of dollars. Now, we've got a $100 billion infrastructure rollout across this nation. It includes such projects as the $14.5 million commitment towards the Midi Ammo Water Supply Scheme. And I know how important that is for Nichols. I know I know how important that is for rural Victoria, and I know how important that is for the committee chair of the Midi Ammo Project, Neil Allen. Now he and so many other farmers in that uh, in that region, they turned up to that windswept football oval when we announced that, and they were absolutely delighted. They knew that for many decades they'd fought for water security. They knew that for many decades they'd fought for better outcomes for infrastructure in their rural Victorian region, and the member for Nichols delivered, as he always does. He's a good member. He's a good member. And he, like all of us, all of us, over that side too, are going to enjoy the benefits of the $100 billion infrastructure rollout that we are doing over the next decade. We've brought a lot of it forward. We've brought a lot of it forward with the, at the request of uh, state governments, and they're not all Liberal and national state governments. Some of them are Labor governments, and they've put their priority projects forward, and we've answered that call. We're getting, we're getting shovels in the ground. We're getting excavators behind those projects. Uh, more broadly, there are 130 major government-funded projects under construction across the country. And the benefit of that, the benefit is that they're supporting 85,000 jobs, 85,000 people in work because of the $100 billion infrastructure rollout, because we're prioritising projects in metropolitan cities. I appreciate the Urban Infrastructure Minister is doing a good job in that regard, and particularly in regional Australia, particularly in regional Australia, doing it tough with bushfires, doing it tough with drought, but still resilient enough to know that this this infrastructure rollout is going to help them. It will rain again. It will get uh, the good times are ahead, and when they are, that infrastructure is going to be in place the to benefit Deputy all Prime of Australia. Minister's time has concluded. Member for Hunter, just remind him he's scheduled to do the MPI. <laughs> the leader of the opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is again addressed to the Prime Minister. What actions is he taking, given uh, the strike force Garrod investigation in the minute? Minister for Emissions Reduction, given his statement of ministerial standards, says ministers must accept this for the PM to decide whether and when a minister should stand aside if that minister becomes subject of an official investigation of alleged illegal or improper conduct. 7.1, Prime Minister. What are you going to do to implement it? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, this is a very recent matter, and I will be happy to take advice from the New South Wales Police in relation to any matters that they're pursuing. Mr. Sp I will be taking advice from the New South Wales Police on any matter that they are currently looking at, and I will form a view, Mr. Speaker, based on taking that advice in considering these issues. And, Mr. Speaker, I would only note this. I would only note this, Mr Speaker, and the Member Leader of the Opposition may want to reflect on the standard that he is setting, Mr Speaker, and I would simply note this, if there are any questions ever being raised in any such investigations by any member sitting on that bench, well, Mr Speaker, he has clearly set a standard. The Member for Griffith is warned. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to table the Australian Government's statement of ministerial standards. Leave granted. Uh, public public document. Leave is not granted. <laughs> Members on both sides. The Member for Indi. question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, before the election you announced $14.5 million funding for Albury Wodonga Health, comprising of $12 million for a 20-bed mental health rehabilitation unit and $2.5 million for a specialist outpatient services. This funding was meant to significantly boost mental health services urgently needed in my rural community. Yet the Minister's department has now said the first payment won't come until 2022 and the remainder is not in sight until 2025. This is too long to wait. 
Minister, will you follow through on your government's commitment to making mental health a key priority and immediately bring this funding forward? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member for Indi. This uh, new mental health uh, rehabilitation unit uh, at uh, Albury Wodonga Hospital was developed in conjunction with the uh, Albury Wodonga Hospital, uh, with the, uh, the then CEO, and very significantly, it was done as a part of an overall package to assist the people of Indi. We worked with uh, the member's pre uh, the member's predecessor, um, and we also worked uh, with. Uh, uh, Steve Martin, who was the candidate for Indi in our time, uh, the member for Farrah, who has played a very important role in the development. Services that we have supported, of which this is part of a broader package, include bringing forward a new headspace for Wangaratta. Uh, that headspace for Wangaratta includes $1.5 million for the establishment and operation. And related to that is the grit and resilience program developed by the community for the community with $1.2 million. That is part of a broader $46 million primary health network investment in mental health. On top of that, we also developed with the community uh, the $14.5 million plan for the Albury Wodonga Hospital. The timing and nature of that was established as part of a master plan being developed. And I'm happy to table the statement about the master plan, which was pre uh, presented by the Albury Wodonga Hospital at the time. So this was developed with the hospital and by the hospital on the timing that was uh, discussed with the, uh, the CEO. And so most significantly, and that was only confirmed yesterday, uh, and most significantly what that means is that there will be new facilities uh, that are available to assist people with mental health challenges as they transition from hospital care to the community. Very importantly, it is part of a broader master plan that is being developed. I am aware that part of the challenge here is that whilst we are delivering on exactly the time frame that was part of the master plan, the state may not be able to deliver. And therefore, as a consequence, their new CEO is under pressure to renegotiate that which was agreed. I will accordingly be writing to the Victorian Minister for Health to seek an assurance that the Victorian government will deliver their part of the master plan, which they have yet to complete on time, in full, which will then allow us to deliver on time, in full. If they are able to bring forward their plans, then we will be able to bring forward their plans. They are currently on track, however, to delay their plans, but we will continue on exactly the time frame we agreed to deliver better health services for the people of Albury, Wodonga and the broader Indi region. The Oh, the, no, the call goes this way. Sorry, we had the independent question. The member for Curtin. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer explain to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain financial management, particularly paying down Labor's debt, is ensuring that we can provide the essential services Australia can rely on? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternative policies that will damage Australia's economy? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Curtin for her question and acknowledge her extensive experience as a Vice Chancellor, as a leading legal academic before she came in this place. Now, Mr. Speaker, while those opposite will recklessly talk down the Australian economy, the Australian people know how resilient the Australian economy is, Mr Speaker. Now, in the face of significant domestic and global headwinds, we've had a punishing drought, which has seen agricultural output down by around 14 per cent in the last two years. Mr. Speaker. We see continued trade tensions, particularly between the US and China, which the IMF estimates will see a fall in global GDP by around $700 billion by next year. But despite all of that, the Australian economy continues to grow in its 29th consecutive year of economic growth, while other major economies like the United Kingdom, like South Korea, like Germany have experienced negative economic growth this year, the Australian economy continues to grow. And we have a triple A credit rating, Mr Speaker. We've seen more than 1.4 million new jobs being created, and we have the first 
balanced budget in 11 years, Mr. Speaker, and the coalition and members on this side of the House will deliver the first surplus in 12 years, Mr. Speaker, and that will enable us to start paying down Labor's debt. Debt that today sees an interest bill of around $19 billion a year. That's more than double what we spend on childcare and nearly as much as we spend on schools, Mr. Speaker. That is the cost of the debt that the Labor Party left the Australian people when they left office, Mr. Speaker. Now, we're not only are we getting the budget back in the black, but what we're also doing is Morgan spending record amounts on schools, on hospitals, on infrastructure, on aged care and, importantly, on drought support, as well as reducing taxes so that Australians can keep more of what they earn as well as earn more. Mr. Speaker. Now, the, last, the election was some 200 days ago, Mr. Speaker, and since that time the Labor Party have changed their leader. They have changed their deputy leader. They have changed the, sh the chirpy shadow treasurer, Mr. Speaker. They have changed the shadow finance minister. They have had these so-called listening tours around the country, Mr. Speaker, and they have had a review. They have had a review which the member for Hindmarch said nothing would be sacrosanct. It would be ruthless, Mr. Speaker. Everything was on the table, except one big thing, Mr. Speaker: $387 billion of higher taxes. And the Mr. Speaker, those are the taxes that the Leader of the Opposition owns, $387 the billion dollars of higher taxes. Concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is again to the Prime Minister, and it goes to events under a different coalition Prime Minister. When Arthur Sinodinus had the integrity to stand aside from the ministry, even though a police investigation was never commenced, Strike Force Garrett has now commenced its investigating the potential criminality of the Minister for Emissions Reduction. Why is he still here on your front bench, Prime Minister? The member for Sydney, member for Sydney, is warned. The Prime Minister has the call. And I would refer the member to clauses 7.1 and 7.2 of the Statement of Ministerial Standards, and that makes it very clear the process, Mr. Speaker. And so I don't take the leader of the opposition's word for these matters, Mr. Speaker. What I will do is what I said in response to the last question, and I will speak directly to the New South Wales Police Force and understand the nature of what these Members reports on my are. Left. And then, Mr. Speaker, I will make the necessary assessments of that case at that time. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to take lectures from the Leader of the Opposition, who is a member of a New South member Wales branch, Isaacs. Mr. Speaker, who had New South Wales government ministers in prison, Mr. Speaker, in prison. I mean, Eddie's coming out in December, Mr. Speaker, but it doesn't make any difference to the fact that he is a member of a rotten branch of the Labor Party. The member for member for Fremantle will cease interjecting. The member for Ryan has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the minister outline to the House how the stable and certain approach of the that the Morrison government is taking to protect Australia and its institutions from the threat of foreign interference? The Minister for, for, uh, for Home Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for. His question is, uh, all Australians know the Morrison government is absolutely committed to making sure that we protect our nation and our people and, importantly, our sovereignty. And we do take foreign interference very, very seriously. Now, as the Director General of Security has consistently stated, Mr Speaker, the Australian public, our country, faces an unprecedented level of foreign interference and we're going to deal with it, Mr Speaker. As the Prime Minister has stated, the government is, of course, not naive to the threats that we face. We've been actively strengthening our capacity to protect, to protect Australia from foreign interference. And, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the House that no nation is better equipped to deal with this issue. In April of last year, the government appointed the first ever national counter-terrorism interference, sorry, counter-foreign counter interference coordinator to coordinate whole of government efforts to respond to acts of foreign interference and administer Australia's counter-foreign interference strategy, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, one of the things that we can derive as a benefit from managing the economy well 
is a further investment into our intelligence and security agencies. And when Labor lost control of our borders, they spent billions of dollars on trying to fix a problem of their own making. They took money out of the agencies, including ASIO, the Federal Police, the ACIC and others, to pay for their broken borders. And we've fixed the, we've fixed the borders. We have managed the economy well, the budget well, and we have invested, Mr Speaker, uh, some $35 million over four years in the most recent budget uh, as follows. We've put $14.5 million into ASIO. We've put $6.7 million into the Australian Federal Police, $8.5 million for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, $1 million for the AG's department, $3.9 million for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And, Mr Speaker, ASIO's budget for the current financial year is the highest it's ever been, and that's as a result of us managing the budget well, Mr Speaker. But we have also introduced a number of legislative measures to tighten our laws to make it more difficult for foreign actors to interfere, and that includes, Mr Speaker, the National Security Legislation Amendment, Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act. And, Mr Speaker, as we know, when Labor is in opposition or in government, they seek to water down every national security bill. We are not going to stand for that. I want to provide another reassurance today to the Australian public that the Morrison government will do everything possible, Mr Speaker, to keep the Australian public safe. It's within our DNA, and we will work day and night to make sure that we keep our country and our people safe. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is again addressed to the Prime Minister, and I refer to his previous answers where he said that he will contact the New South Wales Police about Strike Force Garrett in the Minister for Emissions Reduction. Will he assure the police and this House that the Minister for Emissions Reduction will do what he hasn't done to this parliament and state exactly what the origins of this doctored document about the City of Sydney Mayor uh, was, what the origins of it were? Members on both sides, the Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, the only reference I could make to the Leader of the Opposition's uh, investigative capacity would be as Inspector Clouseau. Mr. Mr Speaker, Member for Isaac, I'm going order. to leave the matters of uh, pursuing these issues to the New South Wales Police, and I will speak directly to the New South Wales Police, Mr Speaker, and I will consider the information they provide me about this matter, and I will exercise my responsibilities under the standards once I have had the opportunity to have those discussions. What I won't do, Mr Speaker, is engage in the breathlessness of the Leader of the Opposition. I won't engage in that, Mr Speaker. I calmly consider my responsibilities. I soberly consider serious matters, Mr Speaker. I don't rush to the judgment of the Leader of the Opposition. And I know why this is happening today, Mr. Speaker, because in the other place, in the other place, Mr. Members Speaker, on both sides. we are dealing with the Ensuring Integrity Bill. Ah, that's the bill we're dealing with over there. And the militant unionism that this mob over here, Mr. Speaker, want to engage in a protection racket. Mr. Speaker, I was wondering what the collective noun was for a group of militant unionists. And I think they're called a thuggery of unionists, Mr Speaker. And that's that thuggery that this Leader of the Opposition wants to protect by not supporting the government's bill to I ensure to that Prime union Minister. thugs are the held Prime to Minister. account. This is a smokescreen, Mr the Speaker, and he's running the protection racket for union thugs. Members on both sides, the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition has to the call. The microphone wasn't on. I, I would ask that the Prime Minister's last statement, where he made a very specific allegation against me, be withdrawn. I just need to. I might have heard it slightly differently, and if I, if I didn't hear it correctly, I ap apologise. Um, I and I don't. I don't want to put the Leader of the Opposition in a position where he has to repeat the. The remark. What I heard was something that's outlined in practice. 
pretty clearly, which was something fairly general. Thank you, sir. Well, I can only I can I can only I can only go on what's said. Okay, I can't get into hand gestures and all the rest. I, the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd invite you to ask the Prime Minister to do the right thing and show integrity and withdraw it. Well, all I can do in, no, look, look, I'm, all I can do in this circumstance is say to a minister or a prime minister if they if they made an unparliamentary mark to, to withdraw it. But I didn't, as I said, if I'd heard that, I would have acted straight away. I thought it was an a a general observation that's covered in practice. I'll call the member for Herbert. The member for Herbert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Will the Minister outline to the House how the stable and certain approach of the Morrison government is helping ensure that Australians have the skills they need and the skills employers need for them both to be successful? The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for his question. And he, like everyone, on this side of the House understands how important that businesses have access to skilled and job-ready workers. And we understand how important it is for workers to be able to access the skills that they need, because skills are the opportunities for them to proceed and to do well, and the opportunities for all Australians to do well. And we understand how important it is that we have a world-class vocational education and training sector here in Australia. Minister of the, the member for Sydney has been warned. She now knows what happens. <laughs> Minister can continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that has given me the opportunity to point out that when Labor was last in office, in their last year, they oversaw nine successive cuts to employer incentives in vocational education—$1.2 billion in cuts. Those opposite, Mr Speaker, were responsible for bringing vocational education and training in this country to its knees. And we are the ones that have methodically gone about rebuilding vocational education and training in this sector, starting with announcing the Joyce Review about 12 months ago and then announcing the recommendations just in April this year, and that was on top of the investment of $585 million. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm about to do a Jacinda Ardern, and I'm going to do a run through. I'm going to do a run Members through. Members on my left. And I'm going to do it in the last seven months. So let's go. <laughs> we have appointed and announced the interim national skills commissioner, Adam Boynton. We've appointed and announced the National Careers Ambassador, Members on Scott my left. Ham. We have got the review of the Australian Apprenticeship National Skills Needs List underway. We have commenced nationalised consultations with stakeholders to design the National Skills Commission, the National Careers Institution and Skills Organisations models. We have got agreement on and announced reforms to the Australian Skills Quality Authority. Member for Cooper. We have announced a third skills organisation pilot in the mining sector. We have announced industry training hubs, including in the member for Herbert's electorate in Townsville, so that we can build connections between local industries and schools. We have commenced the Productivity Commission review of the National Agreement for Skills and Workforce Development. We have hosted the member for inaugural Coop, member for Gordon skills and the member for Cooper are warned. On the 20th of September, where members agreed on three reform priorities for the VET system relevance, quality, accessibility. We hosted the second council just The last Minister's week. time has concluded. <laughs> members on my right. the Leader of the Opposition. 
Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is again addressed to the Prime Minister, and I refer to his previous answers where he said he will contact New South Wales Police about Strike Force Garrett into the Minister for Emissions Reduction and the doctored document about Clover Moore. Will the Prime Minister commit to fully cooperate with any request for information from the New South Wales Police about this scandal? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, um, like with all matters that are pursued by any law enforcement authorities, the Commonwealth always cooperates fully with all of those matters, Mr Speaker, uh, which you would expect us to do, and of course we would, Mr Speaker, of course we would. But, Mr Speaker, just because the opposition has referred matters to the New South Wales Police, and just because the opposition have referred so many matters on so many members, Mr Speaker, and they've all ended up going absolutely nowhere at the end of the day. Forgive me, Mr. Speaker, for not, um, for not uh, leaping to the conclusions that the Leader of the Opposition had the on this Goldstein. day, Mr. Speaker, and breathlessly coming to the dispatch box and making the allegations that he is making against the member and the minister, Mr. Speaker. I understand. I understand why the Leader of the Opposition wants to distract attention today. It's not just because there are 65 representatives of the CFMMEU before the courts across 28 separate matters brought by the ABCC, Mr The Speaker. Prime Minister resume his seat. The member for Rankin, the Leader of the Opposition. Yes, it goes to relevance, Mr Speaker. I don't have the capacity to demand the New South Wales Police launch a strike force into one the of his ministers. Of the and that is what the Prime Minister is suggesting. will resume his seat. The, and I'm just going to say to the Prime Minister before he resumes, I was about to say to the Prime Minister he's entitled to compare and contrast briefly, uh, uh, which he's been doing, uh, but not extensively. Um, he's got to stick to the um, aspects of the question that he was asked. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And to go to the question again, of course we will cooperate with any mm. and all matters, Mr Speaker. I would just hope that the Leader of the Opposition, once we've had the opportunity to review these matters fully, mm. if, uh, if it is indeed the case, Mr Speaker, that he has Leader jumped the, the shark here— Leader of the Opposition, the opposition <laughs> You're getting a bit excited, Mr. Speaker. No, the member for Isaacs has been. I've asked him to cease interjecting a couple of times. Uh, I've already warned him. That's you yeah, know. Don't say a thing for the next hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Members on my right. People want to start taking bets. They can, but that's what I've asked of him. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, once we have worked through this matter, I would just simply hope that the Leader of the Opposition uh, will do the decent thing if indeed, Mr Speaker, this is just one of the many occasions upon which the Opposition have made these references and they've ended up nowhere that just once, maybe, Mr Speaker, they might want to, uh, they might want to walk back from the breathless uh, accusations that they've made. The member for Canning. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Will the Attorney outline to the House the Morrison government's stable and certain approach to ensuring the integrity of registered organisations and the importance of providing cost-effective infrastructure? Is the Attorney aware of any alternative approaches? Great question. The Leader of the House and Attorney General has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for his question. And of course, as all the members on this side of the House understand, Construction is a critical part of the Australian economy and it is uh, a massive part of the spend that this government is investing in the Australian economy. $100 billion in transport infrastructure construction, and that's $40 billion over the Ford estimates. And to understand exactly how important construction is to the Australian economy, it needs to be realised that it's the third largest employer in Australia. It employs one in ten Australian workers. 99 per cent of the 383,000 businesses are small businesses in construction. That's the tradies, the businesses with under 20 people. And having strong laws to maintain the rule of law on construction sites is absolutely critical to the Australian economy. And it will interest, no doubt, every member on this side of the House to know that the total working days lost to industrial disputes 
in the construction industry was six times higher by the time Labor last left office to the time when they took office. And prior to the introduction of the Australian Building and Construction Commission, which of course members opposite opposed in 2005, there were five times the average number of industrial disputes in the construction sector compared to every other industry sector. And in fact, since the ABCC was re-established by this government, the total days in the construction industry lost have been cut in half. And the rate of industrial disputation, though, sadly, is still three times the average of all other industries. And why is that the case? Well, that is the case because the CFMEU business model is to bully, is to lie, is to coerce, is to trespass, is to obstruct. And what does that look like? That looks like a 30 per cent increase in the cost of vital infrastructure like schools and roads and hospitals. As the BCA and Infrastructure of Australia have said, infrastructure projects are 40 per cent more expensive here than they are in the United States. And how does that happen? What is the business model? Well, that's the CFMEU shutting unlawfully down a crane company who loses over six weeks' work. That's the CFMEU in Victoria illegally using vehicles to blockade a worksite, stopping concrete pours. That's the CFMEU in Queensland Member lying and intimidating a landscaper who's a contractor to force him to be a member of the union. And in fact, it was said yesterday, it was said yesterday uh, by the State Secretary New South Wales of the AMWU, he said, we need strong democratic and militant unions. Not just strong unions or democratic unions, we need militant unions. And he went on to say, well done, Tony Burke, for standing up proudly to defend our movement. Well done for standing up for union militancy, because that's what you stand up for. We stand up for the rule of law on construction sites. Member for Cooper. The member for Hindmarsh has the call. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Emissions Reduction. Why did the minister block access under freedom of information to more than 200 documents about his use of false figures in official ministerial correspondence? Is it because he knows that the documents reveal that he misled the House when he claimed he downloaded false figures from the City of Sydney website? And will he now assure the House that all 200 documents will be provided to the New South Wales Police Strike Force, Garrod? The Leader of the House, on the point of order, members on my left. Member for Scallon, I'm just. I'm just saying to those interjecting, uh, cease interjecting. I need to hear the point of order. I've said this many times. If they interject, they'll be out of the house. The leader of the house on a point of order. Well, the first point of order, Mr. Speaker, is with respect to Standing Orders 100 about inferences and imputations, and the mm. use of the word blocking carries a very mm. strong and clear imputation and inference. Members on and my I left. Might, I might note that if that word is to be included in the question, mm. then the question needs to be directed to me as the Minister in charge of Freedom of Information pursuant to Standing Order 98, I would be happy to take the question on notice to determine whether or not that inference and imputation is correct, but I very much doubt that it is. The Manager of Opposition Business on the point of order. Yeah, Mr Speaker, I'd simply uh, refer to your early, earlier rulings about the opportunity for the Minister, if he disagrees with some of the words of the question, to make that clear in his answer. I thank both the Leader. Uh, of the House and the Manager of Opposition Business. As I've made clear um, before and um, for a number of years now, that, as have previous speakers, particularly Speaker Andrew, uh, on this topic, that whilst the standing orders obviously were quoted accurately by the Leader of the House, um, the practice uh, has been uh, lenient with respect to inferences and imputations. That's certainly been the case and indeed Speaker Andrew pointed out that if they were strictly enforced most questions would simply not be in order or not be not be able to be asked. I've always said I'm happy to look at how we might change things in the future, but if we had a strict reading of questions I would have a very strict reading of the standing orders around answers and uh, that can obviously change 
the nature of things. The other point Speaker Andrew made was uh, in ruling questions out of order on that basis, it does prevent the minister for having any opportunity, as the manager of opposition business said. So uh, on this occasion, I'm going to allow the question to, to proceed, and it's up to the minister how he, he deals with that. The minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, as I said yesterday, I made a statement on the 25th of October, which I tabled in the House yesterday. And as I said in that statement, this is an outrageous accusation against me by the Labor Party. But to answer the question, Mr. Speaker, to answer the question, of course I'll cooperate with any matter of this sort. Now, as I said in my statement, I reject absolutely the suggestion that I or any members of my staff altered the documents in question. And Mr Speaker, I won't be lectured to by the party of Aldi bags and wine boxes full of cash, Mr Speaker. I'm not going to be lectured to about integrity in the week, in the week that Labor is celebrating Eddie O'B coming out on parole. The member for Mallee has the call. My question, uh, Mr Speaker, is to the Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management. Will the minister outline to the House how the Morrison-McCormack government's stable and certain budget management allows it to uh, back our drought-stricken farmers and communities? The Minister for Water Resources, Drought. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the, the member for Mali for her question? And the member for Mali knows better than anyone the impacts this drought, the severe drought, is having on her own communities. In fact, a couple of months ago, I was out with farmers in the middle, just outside Mildura, sitting, listening to them, hearing what's working, what more needs to be done in our drought response. And it reaffirmed to me that our government's three-pillar response is having an impact. The three pillars, the first around the here and now, putting money in farmers' pockets, keeping them going until it rains, and it will rain. The second pillar is supporting those communities that support our farmers to get through this drought. They're also impacted by this. And the third pillar about the future. We're the first government to face up to the next drought, because what happens is when it rains, the next drought starts the day after it rains, and we have to prepare for that now. So we're putting aside $100 million a year in dividends to be able to build the resilience and also over $3 billion in water infrastructure to harvest the water, to dig holes and make sure that we grow regional Australia. But one of some of the feedback that came back from the Millibar farmers that, that is evident in our next tranche of funding, over $709 million of now over $8 billion in commitments to the drought, was our centrepiece through the Regional Investment Corporation loans, our drought loans. And what we've retweaked and allowed those loans to change to is allow farmers to refinance up to $2 million from their bank to the Regional Investment Corporation and pay no interest and no repayment for two years, yep. saving a farmer on 6.5 per cent over $150,000 in principal and interest. We are taking that out of big banks' hands and we are putting it back in farmers' pockets, helping their cash flow. We're also saying to those farmers, that you can use it, as I heard from those Millewa farmers, to pay for the fodder and freight, which is the state's responsibility, but we are going to help them be understanding the impacts that has on their cash flow. And we're saying that when it rains, you'll be able, you'll be able to replant and restock with these no interest, no re repayment loans, because it takes time for your crop to grow to harvest and it takes time for your project to grow and get to market. So we understand the cash flows of these farmers. But we've extended it. For the first time, we're taking it to the small businesses, the small businesses that support, that support the agricultural sector, whose cash flow is directly linked to the agricultural sector through services and products. And we're giving them the same terms for loans up to $500,000. But the second pillar we haven't forgotten, we've put over $400 million in direct stimulus to keep tradies moving, to keep towns going through this drought. But with some there's some support we can also get from the states, and I've written to all the states to say, come with us. This is above just one level of government. We all have a responsibility. Pay the rates, the payroll tax, and give Crown leasehold holidays to our farmers and small businesses to support them through this drought. Mm -hmm. If we stand shoulder to shoulder with one another, then we stand to make sure that regional rural Australia survives one of the worst droughts in our history. The Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to move the following motion. Yeah. That this House 1 notes that A. On the evening of 23 October 2019, The Guardian reported the Minister for Emissions Reduction had used incorrect figures from the City of Sydney Annual Report 2017-18 in a letter to the Lord Mayor of Sydney. B. On 24 October 2019, the Minister told the House, and I quote, the document was drawn directly from the City of Sydney's website. C. Despite the Minister's claim, all the evidence to date is that no such document ever existed on the website. The altered document has only ever been produced by the Minister's office, and the doctored figures have only ever been used by the Minister in his official ministerial correspondence. D. Today, the New South Wales Police confirmed that it had launched Strike Force Garrod to investigate the matter. E. Paragraph 7.1 of the ministerial standards make clear that it is for the Prime Minister to stand aside a minister if that minister becomes the subject of an official investigation of an alleged illegal conduct and, two, therefore calls on the Prime Minister to do what only he can under the ministerial standards and immediately stand the Minister for Emissions Reduction down. Yeah. Is leave granted? The Leader of the House. Leave is not granted. The Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that so much of standing and orders be suspended as would allow the Leader of the Opposition to move the following motion immediately. That the House 1 notes that a, on the evening of 23 October 2019, The Guardian reported the Minister for Emissions Reduction had used incorrect figures from the City of Sydney Annual Report 2017-18 in a letter to the Lord Mayor of Sydney. B, on 24 October 2019, the Minister told the House quote, the document was drawn directly from the City of Sydney's website. C. Despite the Minister's claim, all the evidence to date is that no such document ever existed on the website. The altered document has only ever been produced by the Minister's office, and the doctored figures have only ever been used by the Minister in his official ministerial correspondence. D. Today, the New South Wales Police confirmed that it had launched Strike Force Garrod to investigate the matter. E. Paragraph 7.1 of the Ministerial Standards makes clear that it is for the Prime Minister to stand aside a minister if that minister becomes the subject of an official investigation of alleged illegal conduct and, two, therefore calls on the Prime Minister to do what only he can under the ministerial standards and immediately stand the Minister for Emissions Reduction down. Mr Speaker, the fact is they don't the like scrutiny. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Leader of the House has moved that the Leader of the Opposition be no further heard. All those of that opinion. The question is, the Leader of the Opposition be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Division required. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is the Leader of the Opposition be no further heard. The eyes will pass the right of chair, the nose to the left. I put the honourable members for grey and Nichols tell us for the eyes and the honourable members for uh, Wera and Lawler tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 73, no 67. The questions therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? The manager of opposition business. Speaker seconded. They don't like scrutiny, not by the media, not even by the police, the and certainly not by the The manager of opposition parliament. business will resume his seat. The leader of the house. I move that the member no longer be heard. Question is the manager of opposition business be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Members must remain in their seats. Members must remain in their seats unless they're leaving the chamber or did not vote in the last division, in which case they must report, or, or they're changing their vote, I should say, they must report to the tellers. This should be a speech. Lock the doors. The question is the manager of opposition business be no further heard. Members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 73, no 67. The questions therefore result in the affirmative. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, will stand as me nothing under this. The Leader of the House the has the call. The Leader of the House has moved that the question be put. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they're leaving the chamber or are changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be put. I point the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is I 73, no 67. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition to be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. We'll ring the bells for one minute, but the tellers will do a full count. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Lawler and Werriwa tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Nichols and Gray tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 67, noes 73. The questions therefore resolved in the negative. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for the Environment. Will the Minister update the House on the Morrison government's stable and certain approach to dealing with Australia's waste? The Minister for the Environment has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister for the Environment will resume her seat. The Manager of Opposition Business. I move the Minister be no further heard. The Manager of Opposition Business has moved the Minister be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the minister be no further heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. What the honourable members for War, uh, Werriwa and Lawler tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Gray and Nichols tell us for the no. Order. The result of the division is ayes 64, noes 76. The question is therefore negatived. The minister. Members can just take their seats, please. We're still in question time. Minister, the clock hadn't even got switched on, so that's why it's yeah. so the minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and a pleasure to take another question from oh, the member for yeah. Robertson. Oh, and, um, Deputy Prime Minister, I Deputy Prime Minister. I thank the member for Robertson for introducing me to so many of her recycling industry players, including Lysella, world leading commercialisation using old recycled plastic and turning it into oil. And I'm delighted the Labor Party, at least some of the front bench, is here to hear the good messages from the government about our recycling agenda, because this government is the first to have put waste and recycling on the national agenda, backed up by our $167 million recycling investment fund. We're committed to reducing waste, increasing recycling waste, rates and building capacity within our domestic recycling industry. Better managing our waste and improving recycling will reduce impacts on the environment, promote opportunities for local industries and jobs, because importantly, for every 10,000 tonnes of waste recycled, there's approximately nine jobs. Waste, Mr Speaker, is an economic opportunity. It's also an environmental responsibility. As the Prime Minister has said, it's our waste, it's our responsibility, and with Australians generating 67 million tonnes a year and growing, this is a really important measure and a really important microeconomic reform for the government to take. With the dynamic member for Brisbane, um, the Assistant Minister, we've met with industry leaders, peak representative bodies, CEOs, and women and men on the front line of waste handling. The technology is there, the investment capacity is there. It's just about changing the way we think about managing waste and creating markets for recycled material. And I thank the 
Prime Minister and uh, Deputy Prime Minister and applaud him at the 12th meeting of Transport and Infrastructure Council last week. He focused on practical steps to support our economy by better harnessing recyclables. Government procurement can lead the way. And We've agreed a national action plan to, for example, $50 million, $25 million Australian government contribution on the Great Ocean Road upgrade will use the equivalent of 730,000 plastic bags through incorporation into a new asphalt mix to resurface one and a half k's of roadway near Lawn. That's just one example of government leading the way. As I said, Deputy Speaker, um, waste is not a problem to solve. It's an economic opportunity to seize, and yeah. this government is seizing. Our policies will reduce waste, lift recycling rates in Australia, tackle the scourge of plastics in our oceans and waterways, yeah. Yeah. and ensure that we build recycling, resource recovery in a healthy, sustainable yeah. way that focuses on all Australians. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Hindmarsh. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Emissions Reduction. The Minister's department blocked access under Freedom of Information to two sets of emails sent to his office on the very day his conduct was referred to the New South Wales Police. Have those emails also been withheld from the New South Wales Police, and will they now be provided to the New South Wales Police Strike Force, Garrod? The Minister for Emissions Reduction. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, after being in opposition for seven years, you'd think the member for Hindmarsh would know how FOIs work. Freedom of information requests are being, as they always are, processed in accordance with the Act, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, I tabled my statement from the 25th of October member for in the House, in the House, and I stand by that statement. But Mr Speaker, the poor, the poor understanding of FOI from the member for Hindmarsh isn't his only mistake. It isn't his only mistake. We know he was the architect of Labor's energy and climate policies in no. 2013, in 2016 and 2019, Mr Speaker. He was the architect of all of those election-losing policies. He is an election-losing machine, Mr Speaker, an election-losing machine. And now this self-proclaimed self master tactician who couldn't even hold the Labor Party presidency is at it again. Well, Mr Speaker, the member for Hindmarsh is Labor's special weapon. He's an election-losing machine. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House how a stable and certain economy enables the Morrison government to make life-changing medicines available on the PBS, including for people suffering from lung cancer and leukaemia? Is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, member for North Sydney, who uh, is a deep and passionate uh, advocate for new medicines, and I was privileged to be joined by him only last week uh, when we went to uh, Royal North Shore Hospital. And whilst we were there, we were able to announce two new medicines to be listed on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, uh, one for uh, advanced lymphoblastic leukaemia, another one for uh, non-cell uh, uh, lung cancer for stage four patients. Stage four patients. And uh, whilst we were there, uh, we were able to speak with uh, Peter Suffolk, and uh, Peter is, uh, we understand and believe, the first patient in Australia to have been given access to K Truda. And uh, that medicine was provided to him through a uh, trial program and subsequently on a compassionate basis. It's now something that we're making available through the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. That medicine was given to Peter at a time eight years ago when he was given less than six months to live. He is now with us eight years later because of uh, access to Keytruda, and uh, as he said to us, uh, he's feeling fit, he's feeling well, and along the way he's been able to walk his daughter down the aisle. But now we are able to list Keytruda on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, and it's a medicine which would otherwise cost $120,000 a year for stage four lung cancer patients who will now be given access to first-line treatment. The importance of that uh, is it gives them access at the earliest possible time 
uh, to a treatment which can allow them to have their lives protected, to have their lives extended and, as you see in the case of Peter, have their lives saved. And it's not just one or two, it's 2,200 patients. As I say this, I also want to acknowledge uh, the words of Bruno, whom the Prime Minister met with me earlier this year when we uh, made Tegrissa available. I saw Bruno very recently. He's doing well, but uh, he made the point that many lung cancer patients live with stigma. So, On behalf of Bruno, I want to say it doesn't matter what the condition is. We are here to fight for you to make those medicines available. And Bruno, on your behalf uh, and through myself and the Prime Minister, we are saying that uh, there should be no condition which is subject to stigma. Equally, equally uh, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia is a condition that can strike uh, over 2,000 patients in Australia a year. The particular form, which we're able to support now, uh, of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia uh, is able to be treated by blincyta. There are only 86 patients that at this stage we believe will benefit from this particular medicine. But whether it's a large number or a small number, because of the strong economy, we're able to help patients such as 32-year-old Kelly, whom we met on the day. Blincito has allowed her to go on and have a bone marrow transplant, and things are looking very positive for her. So for Kelly, for Peter, for every one of these patients, we are privileged to be able to support you with these the new medicines. The minister's time has concluded. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that questions uh, be placed. Further questions be placed.